thanks for asking me to give this lecture. It's a real honor. I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, and I also would like to congratulate all of the organizers of the past three days of the Career Symposium. Uh, I thought it was really, again, a terrific uh, uh, opportunity for students. I hope you agree. Those of you that attended, hope. I hope you agree with me, uh, and I really enjoyed interacting with the students, interacting with the mentors, and so congratulations to all of you that were involved in some way or another. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm pleased to tell you a little bit about what goes on in my lab. So at heart, we are enzymologists. We like to understand how enzymes work, how enzymes catalyze chemical reactions, but we also would like to use that information to then do something useful with it that something useful can be inhibition if the enzyme is involved in some kind of a disease, or it can be use of an enzyme for synthetic purposes. And actually, today, by the end of the talk, I hope you understand uh, what I mean by that. And so for the last 10 years or so, we have been interested in natural product biosynthesis and the enzymes involved in natural product biosynthesis. And the impetus initially is uh, by something that I think most of you are familiar with, the problem of antibiotic resistance. I think you probably also know that about 75% of our current, uh, currently used antibiotics are either natural products or natural products derived. So there's a very good history of these kind of molecules uh, to be used as human therapeutics. But I think you also have seen some uh, 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 plot like this at some point during your time where it points out that while resistance is on the rise, the number of uh, compounds that have been approved as antibiotics have been declining and the number of companies that actually are uh, doing any efforts in this area has also been declining. Now this was taken from a paper in 2011, actually there is a little uptick after 2012, but it's still uh, the case that we are not doing enough to address antibiotic resistance as a community. Now many uh, of the reasons for that are economic. Uh, and we cannot really easily address those in, in um, academia. Uh, and one of the big economic problems that I think, again, you probably have heard before is the fact that if you're a pharmaceutical company and you have to invest several billion dollars to develop a new drug, you want to do that in an area where you're going to get a return on your investment. And unfortunately, an antibiotic you take for two weeks, the infection is cleared, you no longer take the antibiotics, and to a pharmaceutical company that means no sales, low sales. And so this is not something we can easily change. This is something that um, uh, we need to think about as a community. How can we make it a higher incentive in order to make uh, new antibiotics? But there are also scientific reasons why pharma left uh, the antibiotic research area. So let me introduce one of the reasons, and, uh, and it's a big reason. And that is the fact that natural products, um, which have been really the, the go-to place for antibiotic development, that almost all of the ones that we use currently were discovered in the 50s and the 60s. And in those days, it was very easy to discover antibiotics. So I don't know how well you can see it here, but there, the numbers here are 10 to the minus 1, 10 to the minus 4. That means that there are some molecules that are present in the environment in about 1 in 10 to 1 in 1,000 samples. These could be soil samples, these could be strain collections. And hence, in the 50s and the 60s, it was very easy to find these molecules simply by doing phenotypic screens. You just take soil samples from all over the world, put them on a pathogen, see if you see any activity, <coughs> purify the molecule. And so that has been really successful. I mean, it has been, if you look at lifespan of humans, there's actually one s s a time frame where it all of a sudden jumps up. That's the discovery of penicillin. Otherwise, it's a nice, steady uh, uh, increase in lifespan, but there's one period where all of a sudden lifespan was increased tremendously and that was really the start of the antibiotic era. Now since these by and large have all been found, and that's not entirely true, but certainly the ones that are easy to find uh, have, were found in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Our new antibiotics, if they are to come from natural products, are harder and harder to find. Daptomycin, which is a molecule that was uh, developed at Cubist Pharmaceuticals by Dick Balls and his group. Uh, they estimated Cubist uh, that you can find that or producing organism about one in 10 million samples. And hence, if you really want to find the ones that are out here, it's a very expensive proposition. Because if you want to find something that is present one in 10 million, then you have to screen at least 10 million and probably more realistically 100 million samples in order to find it. And that is expensive. And so this is one of the reasons why uh, uh, pharma has left the natural product arena. And not just for antibiotics, where there's this economic problem, 
but also for things like anti-tumor reagents, where clearly there is a very big market. But even there, pharma has decided that this problem, where we have to spend more and more money in order to find just a lead compound, is not the way they want to go. Now, that's not the only problem with natural products. There's also the structural complexity challenge, and these molecules tend to be uh, very complex. They don't always have the right uh, uh, pharmaceutical properties. And to do medicinal chemistry on a complex structure, it's doable. Synthetic chemistry has come a long way, and in some cases, it's even economically feasible to do that. But in many cases, it's not. It's still too expensive for pharma in order to do something. So natural products have therefore fallen out of, uh, out of favor. Uh, and um, <clears throat> that for a while, it looked like natural products really were not a good place to invest. But fortunately, there has been one development over the last decade, decade and a half now, that has many people very excited again about natural products, and that's the genome sequencing effort. So it's become so cheap to sequence genomes that it's uh, really a, uh, an entirely uh, uh, a ne negligible part of a budget these days to sequence hundreds of genomes. Uh, and so with, it's, just, it's already an outdated number, more than 20,000 bacterial genomes available. We now know that the genetic capacity of bacteria to make natural products is much, much larger than the molecules that are being produced when you grow a bacterium in your lab. And I know those of you that work in the Bachmann labs or have heard people from Brian's lab talk are, are, are familiar with this. Uh, but this is really exciting because it's saying that we have really touched only the tip of the iceberg. We have only seen the molecules that are being produced when we grow an organism in isolation. And that's really, when you think about it, for an organism to produce something in isolation, that's actually a mistake for that organism. There's no business for that organism to make a molecule when it's being grown in a, in a, in a flask with all of its brothers and sisters that are not sensitive to the antibiotic. So the things we have found are things where the regulation actually has gone wrong, where the molecule is produced all the time. The great majority of natural products we cannot easily produce because they're not made if you grow them in the laboratory. So many different labs are trying to develop methods to then access that hidden diversity, all these natural products that we don't know what their structures are, what their activities are. And if we can do that in a very good and high throughput way, perhaps we're back to the 50s and the 60s where by the sheer numbers of natural products, we're going to find molecules again that could be anti-tumor, anti-fungal, anti-bacterial drugs. So how to do this? There's a lot of different ways. And uh, Brian's lab has some really uh, innovative ways to do this, to try and turn on biosynthetic pathways in the producing organism. And the type of molecules where we work at, uh, we believe that the, the, the best way to do it is to try and take the genes from the producing organism and putting it into an organism that you can genetically manipulate. And the easiest ones are, of course, yeast and E. coli. And as you will see as I go through my talk, that's specific for the class of molecules we're interested in, because there we believe that it's really easy to do heterologous expression. So we take packages of genes from the producing organism, put them into E. coli or yeast, turn them on artificially and see, okay, what is being made? And if we can do that in high throughput, can we again get to thousands of different natural products? So the molecules that I will tell you about today then are, are peptides, cyclic peptides, and these cyclic peptides are made by a ribosomal route. So first the ribosome makes a linear peptide.